car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Got an interesting conversation, we believe, coming your way in just a matter of minutes. First, though, kind of the ground rules in case you are new to what we do here. Uh, for the next half hour, we're going to have a conversation on a subject matter that we think is pertinent to you. It's always better when you join the conversation. All throughout the program, you'll see ways at the bottom of the screen how you can join the conversation. Also, attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live all throughout the program tonight. A free, confidential, all fair conversation. So please take advantage of that neat opportunity. Leading our conversation, in fact, the center of our conversation tonight, uh, managing partner of the firm Hollis Wright, Josh Wright. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Hope you had a great week. I did indeed. You Thank know, you. Um, there's a reason why, Dave, we do a lot of these shows on automobile accidents and trucking accidents, and it's not necessarily just to get cases for our law firm. It's because there are so many of these cases out there, and there's so many circumstances where people call and have questions of, how do I do this? How do I handle this? We're talking about trucking litigation mm -hmm. today. One of the interesting things about trucking litigations is there are a half million trucking accidents per year. Wow. I mean, right before the show, we just heard of one. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. you know, a half million of these happen and of those half million, about a third of those are related to either distra uh, distracted driving or a driver that um, uh, is, is over his hours of service or mm -hmm. has um, some issue associated with his ability to, uh, uh, to kind of drive. So, you know, we're going to be talking about that today, and it's a, it's a topic that impacts a lot of people in the viewing audience. Right. This summer, probably like your family did, did a great deal of travel this yep. summer. And, and just the sheer volume of trucks that are on the road, it, it, it's kind of just a, a, a numbers game almost. Um, and, and you oftentimes pass where they're kind of resting and, and you'll see them pulled over, especially later at night. Um, are there, um, is, is there like a code of conduct and are, are there rules to govern uh, the truckers' yeah. conduct as well as the, the uh, trucking companies themselves? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a, a great question. Um, and the reality is when you and I operate our vehicles, we have a certain set of rules that we've got to follow called the Alabama rules, right, that, that we follow mm -hmm. that uh, identify and define what we can and cannot do. Right. Truckers have a whole new set of rules uh, and standards that they have to follow that you and I don't have to follow when we drive our regular vehicles. There's a federal statute, uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Act, that identifies a series of rules they have to follow. Then they're governed by the same rules of the road that you and I are. And then there are circumstances for intrastate drivers, those that drive just in Alabama don't leave the state borders, or drive within 100 miles of their hub, even if they do leave the state borders, called the public service rules that they have to follow that are similar to the federal rules. So they have a whole new set of rules of the road that apply to them, that wouldn't apply to me and you, that are intended to make sure that they're safe on the road. Um, but as I mentioned on the intro, you know, one of the biggest problems that we see is driver fatigue. A third mm -hmm. of all accidents involve driver fatigue. And if you think about it, you know, what you've got is you've got trucking companies, and, and don't get me wrong, we'll always get everyone, every time we do these shows, we'll get someone that's in the transportation industry or a trucker that says, you know, you guys give a bad name to truckers. We're not trying to do that at all. There are a lot of truckers doing it 100% the right way. Would you say, in your experience, most truckers and trucking companies do it right? Absolutely, and a lot of times these accidents are actually caused by the, the, the folks that are following the single rules of the road, like me and you, mm -hmm. that don't recognize the stopping distance and radius of a vehicle, uh, a tractor trailer, don't realize um, the speed by which a tractor trailer is going, and they contribute to injuries. That happens a lot of times, and there's a lot of times people come to us and say, hey, you know, is there a case here? And we say, there's really not, because you actually contributed to your right. own injury. Um, but there are truckers doing it the wrong way, too, mm -hmm. uh, just like operators of regular uh, right. vehicles, and uh, that's kind of what we're talking about today. Yeah, and just, I mean, the margin of error, um, some of what you see being hauled 
just in terms of the weight must just be massive. And so imagine, you know, my little vehicle trying to control, you know, what is that, a couple of tons is what a normal car, I guess, weighs yeah. versus what, what these folks are carrying, sometimes massive amounts of weight. Yeah, so, you know, Alabama is really interesting in the area we live in, in, in the Birmingham area, and then the central Alabama area is unique for a couple of reasons. One is we are literally a hub for transportation from Georgia all the way into Texas, right? right? And we've got a, a north and south interstate mm -hmm. that runs plus 459 that goes around it. When you couple that with, uh, for anybody who's driven through the Birmingham metro area, um, with all the construction being done on I-20, the intent is to make it better down the road, but that has contributed to accidents. And then you couple that with the fact that you've got vehicles that are at 80,000 pounds, 90,000 pounds operating our roads who have a totally different stopping ability, right. a lot heavier uh, versus a three, 4,000 pound car, it makes for a, a recipe for, for serious problems. Um, the I-20 adjustments that have been made from here to Tuscaloosa and from here all the way over to Atlanta, I think have definitely helped and will over the years. Right. Um, but that has created a significant mess over the years um, that there's been construction where we've, we've seen a lot of accidents and unfortunately we get too many calls about it. We love the questions that we get from you all. A question we've got here, how long do I have to file a lawsuit if I'm hurt in a trucking accident? Yeah, so you know, generally the rule is two years. There are a couple exceptions to that. Uh, I'd highly recommend if someone is involved in an accident, they don't want to wait two years though, because right. if you wait two years, you're way behind the curve um, of what's been set by the trucking company. These trucking companies today, David, they are, uh, they've got teams that mobilize on the ground immediately after an accident, uh, where they're statementizing the officer, talking with witnesses, um, they're out on the scene, taking pictures, downloading the black box from the tractor trailer, and doing the things that they need to defend the case. That doesn't make them bad companies. That makes them diligent to make sure that the forensic information and the evidence from the scene is protected and preserved to the extent that there's an issue. How important, again, in your experience, now several decades of, of practicing the law, are those first 24, 48, maybe 36 hours? Yeah, that's huge, and that's why you want to get to a law firm as quick as you can. Um, you know, law firms, some people don't realize this, law firms take these cases on contingency, which means, in essence, that a person never will pay out of pocket for the same quality of legal service that you would get on the defense side of the bar, on the plaintiff side. So, you know, it, you've got, we have a team that mobilizes to be able to, with experts, and they're able to go get the statements of the officers, statements of the witnesses, download uh, forensic data from vehicles, from the tractor trailer. And so we have a team that we provide to be able to hit the ground running very, very quickly um, so that that person who's been injured in the accident has the same quality of legal services as the truckers do. Uh, but we do it under contingency where you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. If we're successful, then of course, you know, you pay expenses, but you only pay expenses if we're successful. So uh, you got to get on the ground quickly and you don't have to hire our law firm. We say that all the time and I truly mean that. There are a lot of incredible lawyers in this state that do an outstanding job, but get to someone quickly because if you don't get to someone quickly, um, you can run afoul of stale evidence, stale information, stale downloads, things that uh, uh, will impact your case for sure. Right. It's time for us to take our first break of the evening. Yep. Right. When, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the federal standards and really what a tractor trailer driver is subject to from a medical perspective, okay. from an hours of service perspective, all super important information that folks need to be looking for if they've been involved in an accident to determine whether or not they're doing it the right way. Good deal. Right here, we will step aside as we do so. A reminder of how you can get in touch with us. Would love to hear from you. Stay tuned. We've got more of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. 
Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury-related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys. Welcome back into the attorneys. Before we return to our conversation about trucking accidents, a reminder, attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live right now to speak with you. That live, confidential, all fair conversation is free and the opportunity all you have to do is just pick up the phone and give them a call. Continuing our conversation with Josh Wright, managing partner of Hollis Wright, talking about trucking accidents. You know, you've heard uh, all throughout our, our life, right? To whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. The weight and um, the size of trucks are there some higher standards? Is, is more required of a truck driver yeah. and a truck company in terms of standards? Yeah, and, and, and thankfully so. We want to make sure that they're um, uh, responsible for complying with some new things given the amount of time that they're on the road. Compared right. to you and I driving to work, it's totally different. It you is. have truckers that may ultimately drive 11, 10, up to 14 hours in a typical day. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and so yeah, there are some heightened standards um, that I think a lot of folks that drive on the road, Dave, do not understand. And, and, and let me give you a couple examples. Okay. Um, background checks are required of those that are on our roads now. The federal standards dictate and mandate certain background checks. You've got to actually, if you're going to hire someone and you're a transportation company, you've got to do a certain background check to uh, determine number of accidents, speeding tickets, whether or not they have a license, those types of things. Those are required. Uh, in addition, um, there's medical cert uh, certifications that are required uh, every two years where if someone has a certain medical condition, it actually could be within a year, they have to be recertified, but generally two years, uh, they've got to be recertified. If someone has a heart condition, high blood pressure, are they taking their medication, those types of things. All things that could contribute to an accident, for example. Um, then post-accident, they're drug tested, where you and I, if we have an accident, probably not going to be drug tested in a typical uh, accident. They have a duty and responsibility to go get drug tested, okay. uh, and then that's reported to their company and also reported um, uh, in the case. And so there are just a whole host of different standards that apply to them. Probably the most significant of all those standards that I alluded to a minute ago is the hours of service of how long a driver can drive. Used to be many, many years ago there were not hours of service, and if you were capable of drinking coffee long mm. enough, you could drive. As we talked about in the show, in the intro and all the way through the show, we've talked about the fact that a third of all accidents involve fatigue with tractor trailer drivers. And that is because they're being, in some respects, pushed to be efficient, pushed to uh, be able to deliver loads, uh, make sure that there are not dead loads or empty loads, uh, and they're, they're picking up freight and moving it from place to place. Right. Again, I want to make sure that we highlight this. We're not saying everybody's doing it the wrong way, but for those that are, um, this show's about them, right? Mm -hmm. So there are certain rules. The rules are a little complicated and they do change every once in a while. Uh, but in short, um, if you've had 10 hours off of non-drive time, uh, non-work time where you can get some sleep, mm -hmm. you're allowed to drive typically for 11 hours uh, on that next day. Okay. You're limited to 60 total hours in a, in a typical week in seven days. Okay. And if you have been on duty for 14 hours, um, you are not allowed to drive, period. So even if you haven't driven during that period, but you've been on duty for 14 hours, you've worked in the yard, um, uh, at, the, at the facility for the tractor trailer company, you've loaded uh, tractor trailers, you can't go drive. And you know, those standards are intended to make sure that drivers are not fatigued. Doesn't mean that they're not still gonna be fatigued, but it tries to reduce the number of fatigue accidents um, that they can. And if you look at the federal standards and you look at the information that's put out um, by the, the NTSB, 
Uh, you'll see that fatigue drive numbers have gone down over the years, and a lot of that has to do with um, with those rules that are, are enforced. Mm -hmm. uh, and drivers keep logbooks. You and I don't keep a logbook when mm -hmm. we drive, right? And like, mm -hmm. do you? I, I, I don't, don't keep a logbook. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we don't keep logbooks. They have an obligation to keep a logbook, and if they get stopped, they have to turn that logbook over. And there are forensic ways an officer can look at that law book and determine whether or not they're complying with the rules or they're over their hours of service. So uh, those sound like standards and expectations of the drivers themselves. Yeah. How responsible are trucking companies for the actions of their drivers? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. It's something we see all the time. Every time I get a case that comes into uh, our office and we sit down with a potential client, that's a question that always comes up is, you know, is the trucking company responsible for the actions of the driver? The general answer to that is this. Um, the trucking company is generally responsible for the actions of their driver if the driver is operating on their behalf. That sounds like it's a simple answer. If you've got an Acme company driver that's driving for a company Acme, right, right, out on the road, you'd say, well, clearly they're operating for Acme. Well, right. it's not always that clear. I'll give you a good example. Sometimes you have what's called owner operators, that they own their own truck they're simply hauling loads for Acme Company. Right. Does not mean that Acme Company is not always going to be responsible, because they may be, but a lot of it will depend on whether the load for Acme has been delivered, and is that driver now in transit as an owner-operator, not for Acme, but for someone else to go pick up another load. And so those things have to be evaluated. And we use things like um, accident reports, um, log books, um, witness testimony, uh, and then documents that we'll get from, for example, Acme Company in my hypothetical, to assess is the transportation company responsible for the actions of the driver. So sometimes they're not responsible. Really? Yep. Hmm. Yep. That's surprising. Generally, you know, the, there are some federal rules also related to insurance. The driver has an obligation and duty to have at least $750,000 of insurance uh, in a case. Um, and there are times when a driver, depending on the type of material that they're hauling, uh, if they're uh, transporting people, think about buses like Greyhound buses, mm -hmm. uh, up to $5 million worth of coverage in okay. certain circumstances. So you can rest assured on this. I have seen in my practice in over 20 years in doing trucking litigation, only three circumstances that I can think of off the top of my head where there was not coverage there was supposed to be but the vast majority of those on the road have got that coverage because if they get pulled over and cannot prove insurance, it's unlike me and you where if you don't have your insurance card with you, you may get ticketed, but you can go back to you know, the, your court date and show them your insurance and that will be dismissed. It's not like that with truckers. You gotta have that, you gotta prove that you are actually covered and then you have a duty to report that to an agency that the officers have access to. So at the end of the day, you can pretty much rest assured if you ever see a trucking accident, there's going to be some form of insurance involved. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell, we, we've done these shows before, yep. and this is a question that we always get, and you can tell we're close to a um, Talladega and a racetrack, but a question about governors. Um, yep. are, are, are trucks, is, is there um, mechanically some things yep. done to, to control the speed? Yeah, so um, the answer is, in many circumstances, that does happen. Um, not in all circumstances. There are tractor trailers on the road that you and I both can agree. They may say they have a governor, but there's no conceivable <laughs> way they have a governor because they pass you going 85. Doesn't look like it. Yeah. But then there are tractor trailers where you're like, man, come on, speed up. You know, you're going yeah. 60 miles an hour in an interstate and they're governor. Governors are a good thing in many respects, but what they have done is they have forced the driver to be even more efficient um, uh, in the operation of his vehicle to get his load to the place that he's supposed to get, which has pushed them in some respects to drive more hours than maybe uh, they're comfortable with. Doesn't mean they're necessarily violating the rules, but mm -hmm. to drive more than they're comfortable with. So governors have a, a really good place, but they also have forced drivers probably to stretch themselves a little more. Um, so you see it sometimes in cases and sometimes you don't. Let me give you something that's kind of interesting. So. You know, um, I saw that firm fact that came in, mm -hmm. and the firm fact was if you have been run off the road or you've had an accident with a tractor trailer, you know, they don't always stop. Sometimes they may not even know that you were involved in an accident. Sometimes they do, and they're over their hours of service and they're gone, right? right. So it's get as much information as you can. We've had many cases, and I've had many cases over the years, where we literally have had to go through and through forensic evidence. Uh, taking governors into consideration on speed, 
logbooks, uh, we've had to subpoena information and then do a forensic logbook evaluation to figure out who was at that place at the time this person claims they were at that place. Mm. Uh, we've actually had circumstances where we've also put billboards up on the interstate. Has anybody seen this accident and gotten hits from it? Really? So there are a lot of things that you can do if you've got good lawyers that are creative to try and find out if somebody left the scene of an accident what to do. Right. It's time for us to take our second and final break of the evening. Yep. So uh, let's step aside. As we do so, a couple of reminders. We'd love to have you join our conversation. Also, be sure to check out uh, Hollis Wright on social media, Facebook, Twitter, as well as Instagram. Just search Hollis Wright. You'll be able to find it there. Uh, great educational, informational resource for you as well. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm attorney John Spay with the Hollis Wright Law Firm. If you have ever had a personal injury claim, the attorney handling your case has likely told you that a portion of your settlement would have to be used to pay back your health insurance company for the medical bills that they paid relating to your injuries. This is called subrogation. In this week's Legal 411, we are answering the question, what is subrogation and how does it affect your personal injury claim? When you purchase health insurance, you sign a contract with the health insurance company, which provides that in exchange for you paying a monthly premium, the insurance company will pay your medical bills when you're injured. Now that contract has a paragraph that gives your health insurance company the right to seek repayment for the medical bills they paid if you in turn use those medical bills as a basis to recover from a third party that caused your injury. The idea is that your health insurance company would not have had to pay your medical bills if it weren't for the wrongdoing of the third party. Now, health insurance companies routinely put attorneys on notice of their subrogation claims by outlining exactly which medical payments the health insurance company is claiming a subrogation claim for and for what amounts. Throughout the handling of your case, your attorney should be aware of the amount of subrogation your health insurance company is claiming and whether all the claim subrogation is related to your underlying personal injury case. That way, if your case resolves, your attorney can then negotiate a reduction of the health insurance company's subrogation claim. Subrogation is one of the many moving parts that can affect your personal injury settlement and what you stand to recover. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and our promise to you. Thanks for watching The Attorneys on WVTM 13. Welcome back into the attorneys. Just a few minutes remaining. If you'd like to join the conversation, uh, give us, uh, get in touch with us. That information at the bottom of your screen. Also, the attorneys standing by just for a few minutes more. So take advantage of that uh, conversation and that opportunity as well. The firm fact they're talking about not giving a statement to an insurance yep. company. Why, why is that important? Yeah. So uh, information that you provide to the trucking company or the insurance company can be used against you. Uh, we're not talking about a criminal context uh, used right. against you, but we're talking about in the context of civil litigation what you say, your actions, the things that you did, um, all those things can be used against you. It's another reason why you want to get a lawyer involved as quick as you can to be able to kind of lead, guide, and direct you through the process. We're not talking about misstating what happened, right. but what you don't need to do is overstate what happened. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of times, uh, and it's, it's, it's really interesting how this happens, and we've all heard about it, but you know, I'll take statements of six witnesses who all saw the exact same accident right in front of them and everybody has a different recollection of what happened. Right. And that's just you know called the witness phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing happens with those that are involved in accidents. Sometimes you see things um, at a different rate and speed than they really happened. Um, 
you just got to be accurate in the information that you're providing. So getting a lawyer to help lead guide and direct you through the process is a good idea. And I'm, I'm sure you're frazzled. I mean, you were just in an accident. Without so question. Not, not sure you're thinking clearly. A question we've got here, what role does alcohol and drug use play in tractor trailer accidents? You know, it used to be that almost 50% of accidents had some form of alcohol and drugs uh, associated with them in the tractor trailer industry. That has changed over the years because of drug testing. It's gotten a lot better. Uh, but drugs and alcohol still play a critical role and having counsel involved in a case can help make sure that that information is protected, preserved, um, because it has a major influence on the value of a case. Give you an example. Uh, accident involved a regular passenger vehicle where someone's injured. The same injury with alcohol involved for the tractor trailer driver uh, warrants maybe double the value. Right, so you want to make sure you get counsel involved to be able to uh, help you in that process mm -hmm. because the drugs and alcohol can have, play a major role. And you know, like we talked about earlier, and this this is a real deal. Not all truckers are doing it the wrong way. I like right. to say that a lot in yeah. this show because we have a lot of truckers that watch this we show, do. and we appreciate them, and yeah. we represent them in cases. Uh, I've got two cases right now where I represent the trucker in cases mm -hmm. where they were injured. But um, you know. Uh, in the cases where alcohol and drugs are related is generally when someone is pushing to try and be more efficient to drive more than they're supposed to and it's an upper or something that's keeping them up not right. a downer or a depressant like alcohol it's generally more an upper mm -hmm. those things play a major role in these cases unfortunately it, it sounds like some of these cases get real technical and require experts who pays for those experts generally the lawyer who represents you will pay for the experts uh, we talked a little bit about contingency fees earlier, David, and the reality is, you know, you want to make sure that you get to a lawyer, whoever that may be, uh, that takes these cases on contingency, that has the resources, the financial resources, to be able to go hire the correct law, uh, experts that can help you. In a typical case, I'll give you a good example. i got a case right now uh, that's going to go to trial in December, and we have got uh, an accident reconstructionist. We have a braking expert. Uh, we also have a, um, a mechanic, uh, and then we have damage experts. We have wow. five total experts in that case, but it's necessary, and the case warranted that in a high-profile case that involved all of those areas. So you want to go to someone who's got the resources that can get you the experts, because a lot of times you can't get to a trial and get to a jury unless you do have those experts. Right. We got a minute and a half remaining. We've covered a lot of ground, but if you could kind of condense it just to a, a statement, something to leave with the viewers, what would you leave with them? You know, what I'd say is this, um, and we say this a lot, uh, you don't have to get to our law firm, but get to a firm and do it quickly after an accident involving a tractor trailer or an accident involving just two vehicles. Um, there's so much data and forensic information and witness information that is necessary to help you and protect you to the extent that you ever need to file a lawsuit. Remember this, David, and this is super important for people to realize, a lot of these cases never get filed, right? right? They're resolved long before they're ever filed because the responsible party steps up and says, we made a mistake. But don't ever forget this, because I get a lot of people sometimes that say, guys, you, you guys are always out trying to get those trucking cases and car wreck cases. Hey, the reality is that a lot of times if you and I are driving and somebody rams into us or runs a red light or they're fatigued, we didn't do anything wrong, right? right? Those people have to be protected yeah. and that's what we're here, here for is to try and make sure they're protected in those moments if they're in yeah. that unfortunate moment. A lot of good information tonight, Josh. Appreciate the time and thank you as always for joining. We really do appreciate you joining us each and every Sunday evening as we wrap things up. Maybe you're just getting a question. You'd love to get in touch with the Hollis Wright Law Firm. Here's how you can do so. Thanks so much for the time. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.